So we've covered a lot of ground <coughs> already on why we need a transformation to sustainable healthy food. Tristram gave a very good example of uh, what can be done as one of the options. And here we have a panel where we have the opportunity to now enter the really most challenging and most inspiring part of the how. How can we accelerate a transformation to sustainable healthy food systems? And we're so privileged to have a fantastic panel with uh, Lindy with Sidanda, Sibanda, who I've had privilege to work with a long time, who's heading the Fan or Pran um, network in Africa. And you may say something more about this uh, uh, during the course of our work. We have Nobel laureate uh, Rick Roberts, 1993 laureate in medicine, and uh, Peter Tidemers, who is a um, leading academic in ecological economics, and I know also a very strong scientist on um, the whole area of um, protein from, from fisheries. Now, I'd like to start with you, Lindiwe, and um, your perspectives on, on how can we actually support a transformation to sustainable, healthy food <coughs> with your perspective from uh, Africa and developing countries. Thanks, Johan. I, will, I would like to propose some radical changes revolutions that we need. I think the first thing for us in Africa is really about eating local. Mm. If you look at the food we are eating and what I was raised on, currently Africa spends about 48 billion US dollars on imports of food per year, and about 12 to 15 billion of that is wheat. Yet when I grew up in my grandmother's farm, we had a diversity of crops. Bread was not breakfast. We had yam, we had sweet potato, we had pumpkin, we had local melons. All that you could eat, the melons we could eat with milk. There was a variety. And I think unless our farmers, our smallholder farmers, go back to what I call the rainbow revolution, where we are not just producing one crop for income, but we are producing a diversity of crops for food. Currently, 75% of the food we eat comes from just 12 crops and five animal species. So we are really exposed as in terms of uh, environmental risks, and we need to diversify the plate, and that's why I call the rainbow revolution. The second revolution I think is critical is going back to the dining room table. We've lost respect for the food. We eat on the go. Yet, when I grew up, dining time was special time. It was time for food that was cooked slowly in community. It was time for reigniting conversations about what we are eating, where it's coming from, who is the best cook in the house. So in my own family, I've introduced by force with my three teenage children at least one meal a week. We're going to sit together cook together, eat slowly in community so that we can talk about the food that we're eating. And I think the third thing would really be about behavior change communications. Mm. There's so much we don't know about what we eat, where it comes from, and how best we can use food to save our planet and to produce healthy diets. So I think really it goes back from the consumer to the producer side. We need to improve communication and that brings need for science. Particularly for us in Africa, our foods, we spend a lot of energy leaching the nutrients rather than closing mm. the leakages. So we need nutrient dense foods and yet we are investing in removing the nutrients so that the food is purified, all in the name of modernizing and westernizing our diets. So I think those are some of the key things I would uh, recommend. Thank you. So, so in, in summary, you, you're actually in a way saying that globalization and, and, and what we're seeing today of the kind of monoculture trend that that leads to is a threat to the food security in the future and that we need to enrich and invest in the local indigenous food cultures. Yep, we're well, producing commodities and not food. Yeah. And that's why <clears throat> we don't have healthy food. That's one key how. And how can we combine that, Rick, with... Uh, I know that you're passionate about the scientific frontier of using modern science to be able to reach the how on sustainable food. Please share with us um, your perspectives. Well, <coughs> one of the things that concerns me greatly is that there is this huge distance between the way we think about food in Europe, in the West, 
and the way that food is thought about and is important in the developing world. And something that's been happening that disturbs me very much is this anti-GMO movement that has taken hold in a big way in Europe, is to some extent um, seen in many other countries. And it is based not on science, not on anything other than an emotional response to GMOs. And so I decided I was going to try to do something about this. I started a Nobel laureate campaign pro-GMOs to point out the benefits of GMOs, to point out that these are not dangerous, and to try to persuade the non-governmental organizations such as Greenpeace and many of the Green parties that they are actually spreading a very bad message when they now go around and say, in the developing world, these are dangerous, don't use them, keep away from GMOs. In fact, GMOs are not uh, something per se, they're the product of genetic modification. Every food we eat in the West has come as a result of genetic modification, because in order to do big agriculture, you need to get good yields, you need to be able to make foods and crops in a way that can easily be harvested, that can have good nutrition and so on. We've not spent any money doing this really in the developing countries. The developing countries have been left behind because they were not seen as a good market. Big agriculture didn't want to get involved in this. But in fact, it is now possible, thanks to modern genetic methods, the GMO method, it is possible to take crops that grow in the developing countries. One can make them much better. You can increase yield. We can increase the nutritional value. And we should be promoting this and not telling the developing world that GMOs are bad. The GMO method is perfectly safe. The science is absolutely clear. We should embrace it. We should remember that in Europe, we can choose what kinds of foods we eat. You've already seen examples where we don't like tangelos because they have a tiny little blotch on them. But if you go to the developing world, in many, many poor villages, they don't have this choice. They need whatever food they can get, and we should make sure that the possibilities of better agriculture that are available here in Europe also can be used in the developing countries. And so that's what our campaign is all about. Mm. I should say we have 121 laureates on this. If you want to find out more about it, um, there's a website called supportprecisionagriculture.org. So I will come back to both of you, to Rick and Lindy, where, with a question. I'll pose it now, but just to give you some thought, some time to think about that and, and take Peter. But Because I think many of us now start thinking, wait a minute, Africa, one billion people, the continent which has the largest portion of malnourished, projected to be two, three billion in just 30, 40 years. What's the solution? Is it Lindiwa's pathway to build on the indigenous cultures from below? Or is it Rick's pathway to use high-tech science to really get uh, an even more productive delivery of food? And I, I want to have your perspectives. Or if it's both, okay? I'll come back to that. Peter, I know that you and I talked just before about your conviction that the how question has a lot to do with awareness towards healthy, sustainable diets. Please share your perspectives. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's an amazing thing. We're in a room of over a thousand people, I think, with waiting lists for attendance. It seems as if everybody is aware and concerned about the role of food in um, environmental uh, issues, concerns. But from my perspective, I think we have a tremendous job ahead of us still in communication. We know of the great work of Tristan and uh, Tara, and they spoke earlier, but I think we continue to need to find ways to convince people. I had an experience a number of years ago um, where one of my PhD students had illustrated at a AAAS meeting impacts associated with beef production and greenhouse gases in particular. Uh, one of the reporters there referred to um, beef in the ongoing reporting as uh, hamburger being the hummer of foods, which was interesting and funny until the hate mail started rolling in. Um, it wasn't just directed at the PhD student, at our lab, it actually came into the university president. So the, the scale of, of um, lack of awareness, 
lack of willingness to, I think, be open to understand um, the challenges uh, is tremendous. I think there's a lot of um, mixed um, messages that we send each other that, while local makes tremendous sense in the context with which you were describing, sort of shifting agricultural um, production from commodity to focus to more traditional foods focused, in a place like Halifax, when I have students um, argue for local food being environmentally superior, I think that the evidence is extremely good that in many cases it's not. Um, I would much sooner have some so, um, forms of our food, particularly the higher impact foods, being brought in, and these are issues that Tara spoke to in her sort of evolution of her understanding, being brought in from distance. If we're going to consume certain foods, we should try to identify foods that are coming from places that are uh, lower impact production and forms, and bring them in in forms that are lower impact in terms of uh, transport. Mm. Uh, so we, we <clears throat> my point is we have a lot of uh, misunderstandings. <laughs> and I think we, so there's a continuing role for science, education, and effective outreach to overcome a lot of our very deeply held, understandably deeply held sort of biases um, and cultural constructs around what is acceptable. But a very quick hit to you. I mean, you are an economist. Do you think awareness will be enough, or do you need really oh, tough well, environmental yeah. regulations, uh, like a sugar tax, <coughs> tax on carbon? Absolutely. Tax. I mean, it would be... So I now, unfortunately, live Canadian. Um, we now have a government that's re-embraced uh, the climate agenda, which is a great thing. We have a government, our federal government, that's talking about um, the importance of a carbon tax. Mm. Uh, lots of other countries are thinking about this, but if we implement it badly, so I, absolutely, awareness we need, because without that, you're going to have political backlash. Mm. You're not going to have people accept the imposition of some of these measures. But you, I don't think we should rely on people having to take decisions on a daily basis on how large the portion is. So why don't we send them other, other messages through prices? Mm. Um, but the problem is, if we don't do it sensibly, we are going to build tax regimes that are going to penalize certain lower emitting foods and reward others. If a carbon tax is applied exclusively on fossil fuel related greenhouse gas emissions, it will favor beef, mm. which will be a problem. Mm. Yeah. So Lindiwe, if you could you share with us your vision for Africa? How, how can we actually feed our fellow citizens in Africa by 2050 through sustainable healthy food? Do, do you see a bridge between your perspective and, and what Rick shared here in terms of the GMO scientific frontier? What, what? I think the challenge we always have with the GMO debate is that it gets emotional because mm. it's presented as the magic bullet. Mm. It's one of many technologies and really it would be criminal for governments to embrace this without instituting biosafety protocols. So we've all signed on to the Cotogen Agreement, but we need to make sure that the biosafety protocols are in place. Then we are talking about choice. Choice should be for the producer, the farmer, and the consumer. And there are systems that need to be in place to ensure that everybody knows what they are eating, where it's come from, and that they have a choice. But going back to the broader question, I think the challenge for me is really Let's improve productivity. Yes, the green revolution that we've been pushing, but better still, let's ensure that the food that we're producing is nutrient dense. And, and there are many opportunities right from the seeds. You've got your golden rice <coughs> about to be launched, that's biofortification, but that's not the only answer. We can look at normal fortification along the value chain. We can look at the post-harvest processes of reducing loss we all know that if food loss and food waste were a country, there would be the third largest emitter of mm. greenhouse gases. Mm. So that already is something, and it's not just uh, in the developed countries. In developing countries, most of the losses, up to 40%, are at farm level, you know, before harvest. So those are the leakages we need to plug to ensure that we get the yields. Mm. But I, I want to speak about agriculture that delivers nutrition, because for a long time we've been hiding behind the word food security, that it's about access, it's about production, and it's about utilization. But most of the training in the 60s up to date has concentrated on yield and not quality of food. 
most of the training is about farm level and we rarely go to the household to understand the food we produce, who is eating it, in what quantities, and how is it delivering nutrition outcomes. So as FANPAN, we're investing in what we call ATUNU, which is agriculture to nutrition, which is looking at what are the pathways for ensuring that agriculture is nutrition sensitive. And this is a new language for most agriculturalists because it's always been yield. Now we're saying, can we deliver quality food that lends, particularly for our half billion smallholder farmers, whose priority is to feed their families and to get income. And once they have the income, we want them to be educated to know what foods to get, and those foods should be available and affordable. And the nutri nutrition-dense foods are currently the most expensive in the African markets. Interesting. No, that's um, so diversity. Yes, clearly. Thank you so much, Mindy. A social ecological food revolution, clearly. So, Rick, am I am I pushing you a bit too far? I mean, you, you you're pointing out uh, from uh, from a science perspective of the misunderstandings related to <coughs> scientific approaches through genetic modification. But would you even go as far to say that without GMO, we will fail? on delivering on food security for humanity over the next 30 years? I mean, I would go that far, yes. Mm. And I can tell you the reason, I'm, I'm not saying it's a magic bullet. It is one of many techniques yes. that one needs. Um, good agronomy <coughs> is also very important. But we do have the possibility using the GMO method to improve crops, mm. to increase yields, to increase the availability of nutrients, and it is just one of many techniques that can be applied. In general, it is faster than traditional breeding methods. It is safer than traditional breeding methods. Um, one of the things that we don't do at the moment is look at our traditionally bred crops and ask, how good are they? Mm. If you look at celery, celery is traditional. It's got carcinogens in it. It has compounds in it that are skin irritants that can cause dermatitis and yet we sell it because it was produced by regular methods, we think it's okay. We don't ask what are the ingredients here, but for GMs, we have to ask what are the ingredients. Mm. We need the same set of regulations for both. We don't need something special for GMs. We just wanna know, is the food safe? What's it got in it? Thank you. Just in uh, 20 seconds, Peter, so I'd just like us very quickly to jump from land into the ocean. I mean, there is an enormous protein challenge for humanity. We know this. A big wedge is required if we're serious about providing nutritious food for seven, soon mm. nine billion people. You are a great fisheries economist. What, what, what do you see the potential in aquaculture in the future? Is, is this a, a key wedge in order to supply food for humanity? I think so. Um, I've, many others do, but it's also a, a space of contention mm. because it's innovative, it's um, emergent. There are people that, um, and I've at times in my past been skeptical about the implications of some forms of aquaculture, and, but of course it's not a panacea. Not every potential genetic manipulation one could do is going to actually deliver the outcomes we want. Similarly, not every form of aquaculture is going to um, be environmentally superior to current alternative, uh, the, you know, the current mainstream livestock systems, but I think we have enormous opportunities to shift resources, terrestrial resources, crop-based resources, to feeding fed aquaculture away mm. from land-based um, livestock, and to find new species and opportunities for culture. Mm. Um, it, we can't continue to, um, just to put it into context, in the United States and probably Canada as well, we eat about four times as many units of beef, beef alone, as we do all seafood combined. Yeah. The opportunity there for shifting is huge. Mm. So dear friends, time is out. I think a short summary would be to say that what our panelists are sharing with us is that we're talking about a science-based, inclusive, fair transformation towards a rainbow revolution, which is based on a diversity as a Swedish smörgås board, <laughs> if we're seriously going to successfully do this transformation. Thanks Thank so much to the panelists, Thank and uh, let's move on. Oh.